Okay, right. Good afternoon, everyone. I believe the, the webinar is now being live streamed. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Before we start, may I ask all attendees to mute your audio and switch off videos, please. And please be aware that we will be recording today's webinar. My name is Hadimo Sazadeh. I'm Director of Research, Innovation and Enterprise at the School of Science and Engineering um, at the University of Salford. Um, I'm quite new at Salford, joined the university a couple of months ago in October um, from Warwick University. And today I have the privilege of chairing this seminar from um, Manchester Academic Health Science Centre and Health Innovation Manchester. Um, which is a partnership between um, NHS Foundation Trusts across the Greater Manchester area. Um, and the aim of the partnership is to bring together leading um, healthcare providers with um, some of the world-class academics and researchers across the Greater Manchester region. Um, and that's the purpose of this seminar series, to showcase the great research and innovation and clinical science being undertaken um, within Greater Manchester and its impact on the health and well-being of the local population. The title for today's seminar is Surface Coatings for Improved Infection Control and Acoustics Research for Health, Well-being and Accessibility. We have two of my brilliant colleagues from Salford University, Dr. Heather Yates and Professor Trevor Cox, both of them um, from the School of Science, Engineering and Environment at Salford. We will have um, Q&A after each talk, so please feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat box um, to be covered at the Q&A. Uh, our first speaker is Heather. Um, she is a reader in physics at the School of Science, Engineering and Environment with research expertise in deposition of thin coatings chemical vapor deposition for a wide range of applications, such as infection control. And that's actually what she's going to talk about, surface coatings for improved infection control. Okay, over to you, Heather, thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'll just start sharing my screen and put the presentation up. And hopefully you should all be able to see my um, presentation. Um, so what I want to talk about today is my work in developing thin film coatings which can reduce the transmission of, of uh, infection. Now I'm a material scientist and I will be linked up with microbiologists here at Salford and with some biologists over at Manchester University. And what we want to do is to develop some long-term and effective infection control solutions. So I'm going to talk a little about the coating process I use, how I put those thin films on things like glass and steel, and then go on and give some examples of infection control surfaces. Um, we all know that there is a problem with bacteria and viruses, particularly antibiotic resistant ones on contaminating surfaces and how that can lead to transmission of any infection. Now this is a particular problem in healthcare where you already have lots of patients who have weakened immunity so it's very high burden on the health and UK economy and my aim is to reduce the amount of microorganisms on these surfaces and once that's down we can reduce the transmission of that infection the way I'm going to do it is by putting thin antimicrobial coatings on surfaces of glass and steel. And then it can prevent the survival of these pathogens. It can kill them, disable them, and then check the feasibility of these in a challenging healthcare environment, um, basically sulfur oil. And what sort of surfaces am I looking at? Well, I've decided to concentrate mainly on looking at stainless steel because that's used everywhere. You find it storage cupboards, particularly commercial kitchens for surfaces, health, door plates, handles. It's all over the place. So if I could put the coatings on them, it would make a huge difference to people's health. It's also done in glass. Um, for example, NSG, 
Pilkington's has brought out a product in glazing to use in commercial transport, residential homes, could be used splashbacks or even touch screens where you have a lot of people collecting tickets, for instance. Um, in the example I've got, I've shown the amount of bacterial colonies and against time. And if you've got uncoated glass, that's the red line, you can see that there's very little difference in the amount of bacteria there. However, with this coating, particularly in UV light, you massively reduce the amount of bacteria on the surface. Now this needs UV light um, and it can last the activation for about two hours. And it's typically the same process that um, Pilkington sells its um, self-clean glass. So what am I doing for my research? Um, using deposition, a technique called CBD, which is very capable of industrial integration. It's already used in industry. But at Salford, we have got a unique open environment version that mimics this inline production. Um, doing various testing, we're optimizing various ISO protocols so we can look at the effect of different microorganisms on these selected coatings, and then working with Salford Royal, putting my coatings in different environments within the hospital, looking at a range of samples and how they interact with various um, microorganisms on it. And then within microbiology, this is at um, Salford, we're trying to work out what types of bacteria and viruses we've got in each type of coating. Um, characterizing certain species, particularly something like MRSA, that is um, resistant to um, antibiotics, and then look at the long-term effects, looking over six to 12 months, because if you want a commercial product, it's got to keep on working and reducing the amount of bacteria on that surface. So my background is putting thin films on a range of materials, glass, metal, even low melting point plastics and there's a whole range of functional materials I can produce this way but the one I'm concentrating on today is the biocidal. Um, various examples at the bottom of what, where I've used these um, coatings. Now the second one along looks like a very blue square of material. It's actually a thin coating of um, tin oxide on glass and it only has that vivid blue colour due to the thickness of the film and the interaction with light. So what is CVD? It stands for chemical vapor deposition. And what happens is that um, in a gas flow, you have the chemicals which are taken into the reaction area where they flow over your substrate, the glass or the steel or the plastic that you want to coat. Where at deposition, the chemical reaction takes place, you get the thin film, waste products removed and you have the coating on your film. Well, my process takes place at atmospheric pressure, which reduces the engineering requirements. And the energy for the chemical reaction can be thermally by just heating the substrate platform where the sample sits, or you can assist it by the use of a plasma or flame. The process can take place either in an enclosed system, like the examples I've got in my lab below, there's batch systems, or we can do it in line with continuous production. Now this picture is of continuous production in line CVD on a, a float glass line. So what happens is you have the raw materials, they're then floated over a bath of molten tin, but the glass gradually hardens. And then later on, you have these large coating heads, picture on the right to show the size, where all your chemicals come through and flow over the surface of the glass forming that thin coating. Now in my lab, I'm trying to mimic this process, probably not quite as impressive, but it works very well. So what I have is a choice of reactors where you have coating heads where the chemicals come down and they flow over the material I'm trying to coat. And then that moves along. But in my case, I have to move back to keep on increase, increasing the um, thickness of the films. So I have thermal where I'm just heating it flame assisted CVD, where you're using a propane air flame mixed in with the chemicals or plasma enhanced CVD, the example at the bottom, where you can see a purple glow of plasma as it's coating some thin plastic film. Lots of advantage of it. The first is you can integrate it into industrial inline processes that already exist. You can scale it up, 
You can do deposition on large area substrates, fast deposition, and various, the one I'm particularly going to talk about, flame assisted CBD has added advantages. You can just use aqueous salts to low cost and low toxicity. So for infection control surfaces, I'm um, using these various chemicals, for example, silver and copper, these have been long known. The Romans used them, the ancient Egyptians used them to keep infection down. And now today you can use silver um, mixed in with um, wound dressings, say for plasters or catheters, or even ointments for skin infection. Copper um, is long been used as an anti-fouling surface on the base of boats, but it's often used as in water systems in hospitals to control Legionnaires disease against E. coli, um, fast food poisoning, or various resistant bacteria such as MRSA. Now the complication is these are quite expensive materials. So if you can use it mixed in with something else or a thin film, you're reducing your cost. Also, they're quite soft. So if you can mix them with something harder, they've got more of their durability and they will last much longer. So I'm mixing them either with silica or titania, which are both chemically and mechanically stable. Titania, in fact, is um, found in toothpaste, so it's definitely non-toxic. Titania has an added advantage. It also has a property of being a UV photocatalyst. So it means that it can destroy bacteria, it can deal with water purification and so on. So the technique I mainly use is something called flame assisted CBD. So I'll just show you a quick clip of what happens. So basically I have a nebulizer with a liquid which forms a mist. And you can see it's this kind of misting up inside the beaker. That's um, copper sulfate in there in water. And I will be passing through that nitrogen. So it will take the nitrogen and the mist into my reaction area where it goes to a coater head along with a propane flame. And you can see there the green flame. It's green because of the copper. And that passes over my material. In this case, I'm coating glass. And it can go forward and back. The number of passes just increases the thickness of the film. So looking at growth characteristics, um, in flame sister CBD, you get what's called island growth. You can see the examples on the left, the copper oxide and the silver. It's forming small islands. So how many times you pass the coat ahead over that, it's increasing. But as you can see from my graph in the middle, as you increase the number of passes to start with, the thickness of the film doesn't increase. That's because you're getting a little island of the copper or the silver, and then in between it will start growing a new island. It's only when your surface gets completely covered, it then starts to increase in thickness. On the right, I've got the material I'm turning to mix it with, which is titania. You can see that is much smoother. This is done by thermal CBD and it's a much more compact, smooth film. So how do you combine the materials? Well, what you find, you put one on and then the other. You don't get thin layers of either. They tend to mix, mainly because both silver and copper diffuse highly at temperature. So you end up with a mixed surface. This mixing of surface also changes what order you have and the structure of the titanium dioxide because it's got two crystal forms. So looking at the structure on the um, glass titania, it's got anatase. If you put silver on top, it doesn't really change the surface, the picture on the left, it looks very similar. However, if you put the silver down first on the glass and then put the titania, on the top image, you can see little light colours, which are the silver that's percolated through. But depending on which chemical I use for the titanium, um, if I use titanium um, tetraisopoxide, you get this anatase structure. And if I use a different material, titanium tetrachloride with ethyl acetate, you get this rutile structure. So what you put in makes a huge difference. On the right, I put examples of putting copper oxide down with titania. And you can see on the top, you're still getting those little island growths of copper oxide, but now they're coated with small crystallites of the titania. 
and gradually, as you put more titanium on, you can see that it's filling in the gaps in between and the surface gradually becomes smoother. So looking at some of the antibacterial behavior, on the left, I've got examples showing the amount of bacterial colonies. This is time of E. coli. The top line shows the control, which is glassoni, and you see there's no change in the number of colonies of bacteria over time. But when you've got the thin layer of silver or copper oxide on the surface, within a very short period of about three minutes, you've had probably a log six, log seven um, drop. So you've just about killed all the bacteria on those surfaces. On the right, I've got an example of something that was done at Salford a little while ago. Uh, we took ceramic plates and they were coated with a mixture of silver and silica and placed in the um, ladies' toilets in um, Salford. You can see on the graph, the uncoated ceramics, that's the black lines, showed very little difference. In fact, the amount of um, bacteria grew over that time, while the gray lines show how much less you had in the load of bacteria on the samples that had been coated. On the bottom, I was looking at touch screens that get a lot of use. And to have an anti-reflection layer on them, which is what the silica makes, to make them clearer. But if you could add an antibacterial property to it at the same, you would reduce the transmission of infection. So we did a mix of silica, copper oxide. You can see the um, three-layer mix work best, um, reducing the bacterial count um, within at least six hours and maybe 24, because that's when the tests were done. However, one of the problems is you want more copper in there to improve the antibacterial effect, but the more copper you add, as you can see from the light transmission, it massively reduces the amount of transmission of light. And for a touch screen, you do want to be able to see through it. Well, this is more recent work. I'm concentrating on looking at using stainless steel because the amount of uses it had in most um, commercial interest. So I'm adding copper for the antibacterial and antiviral behavior and titania to harden it and for the photocatalytic behavior so we can get some durable self clean surfaces and then reduce the transmission. Picture on the left shows the blank substrate for the metal and then with coatings of titania on it, as you can see there seems to be a, a red color when it's thickest and a blue color when it's thinner. Again, this is just due to interference effects from the light. And then a mixed coating of about roughly 100 nanometers in total. Putting layers and dealing with um, microorganisms on steel is more challenging. If you look at the um, optical microscope times 10, you can see a lot of striations from the steel. It's much rougher than glass. The um, roughness can be measured, root mean square. Metal is so much more rough at 300 nanometers opposed to glass at two nanometers. So you can see the challenge because the microbes can obviously hide within those striations, making it more difficult to kill them. The piece of metal I've got was massed. So the top blue bit is where the coating is and the bottom where it isn't. At the bottom, I've got a micrograph high resolution of the metal and the little lumps on it as the island growth from copper oxide. And in between, which is shown by EDAX, you're getting the um, titania coatings in between. So we started off with some simple um, tests working with um, Melbrecht Microbiology, in which they took two types of bacteria, uh, gram positive, gram negative, and looked at the reduction in the amount of bacteria colonies over a 24 hour period, taking the control and the sample to see what the difference is. So the bigger the log reduction, the, the better antimicrobial activity it showed. You can see during the M is metal, the G is glass, that on glass, generally speaking, it works slightly better. But what we can see, because we also took a commercial sample, uh, a door plate that was advertised as being antimicrobial, and you can see the numbers there are lower. So my, my research samples work better than the commercial door plate for these materials. Um, recently, we've taken on a MFIS student who's just started. And this is some work he did looking at my samples of copper titania coated 
And what we've done is to make this quite visual. We've taken agar plates, my samples, and what happened was a known amount of um, bacterial colonies were put on the surfaces. My samples were pressed into them, removed, and then put onto clean agar plates and the bacteria allowed to incubate. So the first one at zero minutes with little blue squares around, you can see the amount of colonies. And then over time, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 and so on, you can see a total drop in the number of colonies. Um, the information is also put in the graph on the bottom right, showing the log reduction. So this is um, a log reduction of about two. And this is very good considering it takes place under standard lab lighting. And um, the importance of light activation, this is um, earlier work. And if you look at the log count on the left, you're going from the control with no change in the amount of colonies, dark activity is basically in lab light. You're getting a small amount of reduction and antimicrobial behavior, but just add a small amount, 0 0.1, 0 0.25 microwatts per centimeter cubed of UV light, and immediately you have a massive reduction in the cell count. So it's important that you can activate the surfaces under UV. Well, the importance of light activation, um, Titania has the property that you can take a hydrophobic surface, put UV on it, becomes hydrophilic and it spreads out the light. It spreads out the liquid, and this would lead to better spreading of the microorganism cultures because they're in liquid. Also, the photocatalytic effect to degrade, remove organic materials. It degrades them, just any organic basic steric acid, and under UV, you're getting carbon dioxide and water. So you can use this to destroy both live and dead cells and renew the surface for further use. So we also, this is actually results got from Manchester um, from professors Paul Clapper and Professor Pam Valley. We only got this results on Monday, starting to look at antiviral surfaces as a preliminary results. Um, they were using uh, herpes virus, and after 24 hours exposure, we were getting a log, nearly a log three, log three and a half reduction. So we're showing activity in this enveloped virus. And we're hoping on the new year to move on, um, having optimized the technique and also the opening of the category three labs at Alderley Park, be able to look actually at the SARS virus. So the aim is to develop these surfaces. Um, using copper with titania, the effect of metal loading, morphology, behavioral differences, and to study the effect of SARS viruses, which is particularly important. And we're hoping to optimize these coatings in sulfur royal in a range of positions, corridors, washrooms, and particularly sluice rooms, where the amount of bacteria would be particularly high. And the example on the right is an example of one of the sets of coatings which are going to go up on the wall in Salford Royal um, with different, um, different recipes for the mix of the copper and the um, titania. So to summarize, I hope I managed to show you that CBD is a very flexible process for deposition. The fact that it can be integrated in industrial processes and it gives added value to bulk materials for these coatings and showing the use of silver and copper combining with silica or titania to give an antibacterial and an antiviral process. So finally, just some acknowledgements for the various places for funding, but particularly like to thank people in materials at Salford, Bill George, who's been helping me out, former student got his degree last year and postdoc John Hodgkinson and University of Microbiology, Chloe James, Joe Lacken, Latima, new student Ben, and Salford Broyle, um, Sarah Withers and Natalie Garrett from University of Manchester Microbiology. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. That was a very interesting piece of work and very interesting research area. Um, it's, it's it was great. 
There are some questions on the chat box I'm, um, I'm going to cover now. We've got five, five-ish minutes. Um, let's, let's cover as many of them as we can. The first one is from um, Trevor Cox. A problem with using acoustics absorbent in healthcare settings is that the most common ones are porous materials. Can you do anything to porous materials to make them more usable in hospitals? Um, I would have thought the main problem there is the fact that porous, you're going to absorb things in. But if you have a porous material and with CBD, depending on the size of those pores, you should be able to pour into it um, some, say, copper atoms or something of that sort to help with deal with the um, micro, well, the um, microorganisms that are in there. Being a gas phase process, it should be possible to get them in there. Okay. Um, yeah. I think that would um, that would answer Trevor's question. Um, Lloyd Gregory, um, do you want to come online and ask your question or questions? Maybe a couple of questions. We, we, we have yeah. time for that. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Heather. I really enjoyed that 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 presentation. I've got I've got three very simple. Well, I, I assume they might be simple questions, uh, but uh, let's see. So my first question is: How long does it take to develop the coatings before they're ready for for use in the real world? I mean, you know, lots of innovations take years to kind of get from bench to bedside or into hospitals. How long does it take to develop these coatings? Um, that I don't know, but I, what I can say is the technique I use is already there in industry so what i'll be passing over would be my ip for the the recipe and the fact that we have the testing to show that they work so we wouldn't have to develop new equipment to do the coatings okay thank you i know uh, it isn't a date no 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 but i don't yeah. know is it does it take take years particularly for like new anti you know antibacterial or, or like for covid how long is it going to take to develop a coating that you that uh, well, the laboratory the, 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 the first thing i need to find out is whether they do work with covid i know now that they work with other related or viruses that are enveloped in the same sort of um, virus but we need to say the category three lab at Oldsby park being up and running to enable us to check these things out. And I suspect, although some coatings will be um, used almost immediately because we know the level of toxicity for things like copper, silver, titania, we're all quite happy with that. But maybe in a hospital environment to check the level of um, reduction in transmission, you would need a massive clinical trial and that can take several years. But the way things are going, the way we say, for instance, it, they speeded up looking at vaccines, it could normally take quite a few years to get. We've done it in less than a year. It may be with the right will, we can move things on faster. Bro, excellent, that's encouraging to hear. Uh, my second question, if I may, is, do the coatings have a lifespan before they need sort of replacing? The work I've done so far, if I just put copper there or silver, yes, it would have a lifespan because they're soft and they'd end up being rubbed away. But mixed in with the other materials, particularly the titania that can renew the surface, I think, I mean, I can't see why it can't keep on lasting. We've done some accelerated testing on the past with glass with these surfaces in which we boil them in autoclaves which is going to be worse than ever having real life. And they've survived three or four times in there. So I, I have quite a lot of confidence that they would last in the real world, maybe, I don't know, five years. Excellent. Okay, Hadi, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask my third question or do you want to take some other ones? I see some more appearing in the, in the uh, chat box. Yes, if I may go to the, to the next one, um, Lloyd, but you're more than welcome to um, contact um, Heather um, directly after this um, this webinar and and follow it up with with her and I'm sure Heather would be happy to answer any further questions and look at any um, even collaboration opportunities. Um, thank you very much, Lloyd. Um, the next question is from Jonathan Massey. Jonathan, do you want to come online and ask your questions? Because I've, I've read through your questions and I, I because this is not my field of expertise, I wasn't quite sure whether I understood it and I can convey your question properly to Heather. 
Do you I'm, I'm reading it at the minute. I point out I'm not a microbiologist. Um, I suspect the biological, the um, bacterial makeup on those surfaces would differ depending on where they were. We've only oh. used one area. This is why in Salford Royal we want to put them in three or four completely different areas. Not not tiles, I admit. These are things on steel, but to look at them in different areas to see what's there. And yes, we are intending, I understand from the microbiologists I'm involved with, we are going to test this metagenomic sequencing of the DNA to see what happens. Okay, just for the benefit of those who joined us um, on live stream, I'm going to just read the question. So they, they put some, some context into what, what you just described, Heather. In the real world testing of the coated ceramic tiles, there was a reduction in bacteria growth versus control. Do we know if the bacteria makeup on these surfaces um, differed? Could metagenomic sequencing be employed? Also, does it affect biofilm formation or structure? That was the question Jonathan asked, and um, you already had um, Heather's response to that. Thank you, Heather. Um, we've got a couple of other questions, but um, I'm going to go to our next speaker for now. And then if we get time at the end, um, we will cover them. If not, I would encourage Peter, Clayton, and uh, Jian Lu to please contact Heather um, directly. And as, as I said, I'm sure Heather would be more than happy to answer those questions. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank thanks for your talk. I will stop showing the... my screen now. Thank you. And thanks for all the questions and all the discussions. So our next speaker is Professor um, Trevor Cox from our Acoustics Research Innovation Center at Salford. Um, Trevor is an expert scientist in all things relevant to acoustics with an internationally recognized portfolio in research, education, and commercial activities in acoustics engineering. And uh, his talk is about acoustics research for health, well being, and accessibility. Again, at the end of um, his talk, uh, we will cover um, um, co any questions which will come up on the chat box. So please feel free to put your questions and comments on the chat box. Over to you, um, Trevor, and you have already shared your screen. It's working. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, um, so I'm, my talk's going to be a bit more broad brush because I'm, I'm at the head of the Acoustics Research Centre, so I'm going to be talking about one of our critical strategy strands, which is around health, well-being and accessibility, but it's worked by quite a broad kind of area. Um, and I want to start by just giving you a sense of what acoustics research is at Salford to ground because one of the things I see at this talk doing is actually to sort of kind of try and develop some networks and collaboration so just to give you a sense of who we are I mean the first thing you may have not particularly heard about sort of acoustics as a subject because it's a kind of hidden discipline but it's basically the science of sound and so what we're talking about here is we're talking about speech or music or natural sounds or noise and vibration those are the things we're de dealing with and these are critical to life. So it's it's speech, as I'm doing now. It's a communication or it's enjoyment. It's for music or there's negative things like noise pollution uh, causing things like cardio cardiovascular disease. Or, of course, in me medicine, it will be scientific exploration through things like ultrasounds and stuff like that. And below is just some applications. Now, this is a general slide about acoustics. It's not specific to Salford. So I say there's a few things on here we don't do and probably most relevant to people on this call. We don't particularly do medical ultrasonics and we don't do a lot of our cochlear implants. So those are two things that aren't in our particular expertise. Um, but, you know, it's a very broad range where there is sound. There is acoustics research to be done. And we cover a huge range all the way from designing of machines through to designing of buildings uh, and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, we, we've been going quite a long time, uh, over 60 years now. Um, for acoustics, we're a big group, 14, but I guess in, in terms of other groups, that's quite small. But actually for acoustics to have that many people in one area, in one place is quite unusual. Um, and as well as doing the research with the usual sort of research income from EU and EPSRC and all the usual sources, we also teach courses in acoustics and audio all the way from undergraduate to postgraduate, including research. Um, but possibly one more unusual thing we do is we do a lot of work commercial testing and commercial R&D. In fact, we have 10 staff whose work is entirely about 
working with UK industry. And that's a broad range of industries. So that could be all the way from satellite testings through to environmental health, through to automotive, all sorts of different areas we work in there. And that's a bit unusual, I think, to have such a big commercial unit alongside everyone else. Now, central to what we need to do is we're an experimental discipline, acoustics, because it's about sound. So we have very extensive laboratories. So this is our anechoic chamber, our full anechoic chamber. We also have two small anechoic chambers as well. Uh, this is a hearing defender rig in the mid middle here, but of course, being a university photo, this is a staged photo. Um, so we have spaces where we can make very precise acoustic measurements. So here is a very quiet space below the threshold of hearing, so we can measure incredibly quiet sounds. But what you're also looking at is all those foam wedges that are also on the floor is about absorbing sounds. So if you're measuring something acoustical and you measure it in a room, you get the effect of the room. So what you do is you put it in this space and all the foam absorbs the sounds, you just get the source of the sound you're trying to measure. And that could be microphones that might be, or it could be loudspeakers, it could be all sorts of kind of uh, different things. And the other extreme, we have reverberation spaces, which are these are like big echo chambers, and, and these are used all the time for measuring building products. And I'll talk about them a bit later on because the acoustics design of schools or should I say more hospitals is probably more relevant to you, is very important. So we're a physics lot, you can see we're doing quite a lot of physical measurements, but we're also very interested in how people respond to sound because in, in acoustics, when it, what it comes down to is a lot is about how people respond to it. So we have listening spaces. So here we have Alex, one of my postdocs, sitting in the middle of a, a really big ring of loud speakers. This is a Wayfield synthesis rig, uh, which is a surround sound system that you might use in virtual reality systems. And we've done a lot of work with things like BBC R&D uh, on spatial audio, for example. So we, we, our work spans all the way from the physics through to the psychology and bits in between as well. So we're quite a broad ranging group because sound is quite a broad ranging discipline. So I hope that gives you a sense of what we're about. And now I want to launch into the specifics of a few of the projects that are in health, well-being, and accessibility. And I'll actually take accessibility first. So uh, I'm involved in, I'm one of the investigators on the EPSRC project called the Clarity Challenges. And that's about trying to improve the processing of sound and hearing aids. So when we talk about accessibility, we're often talking about speech intelligibility. Um, and we're all familiar with the problem of going into a, a railway station and not being able to hear announcements or maybe hearing mumbling on television. We're all familiar with those kind of problems. Um, and usually when you talk about accessibility, it's usually about speech, but it's not, not entirely. Um, so the EPSRC project, it's is joint, as you can see, with other universities as well. It's about trying to get the processing hearing aids working better for speech and noise. And I think what's interesting here, if you're not familiar with these sort of processes, is how the research is being done. There's the word challenges here. So rather than researchers at these universities sitting and making the processes themselves, we actually set challenges up and then get teams from around the world competing to try and better themselves. And that this is the way you get research work in. It's common, quite a common process, process in, uh, in research, um, first kind of probably developed across by the military in America, but it's really common in machine learning now. So the idea is machine learning, deep learning, all those techniques should be able to improve hearing aids. And that's the idea of the project. If you want to know more, you can look at the URL. We're run, currently running a challenge all about how do you predict speech intelligibility for people with hearing impairment that has just launched. Uh, another project, uh, and this one is across with Manchester, um, with MANCAD, um, so the Manchester Hearing, um, Hearing and Audiology Group, um, is on about face masks. So we're all familiar with this, aren't you? You put a face mask on and communication gets uh, harder. And we've been working with Michael Stone across in MANCAD about how we might improve the situation. Uh, I can show you a few graphs from this one. So here's, here's first of all, here's the kind of typical situation. So you have a cloth mask, which or sort of familiar design you might have done. This, by the way, is a dummy head. It's a mannequin for measuring, uh, for measuring acoustics. So it's got a, a loudspeaker in its mouth, which is why uh, we have this mannequin here. And, and what happens is people put these clear uh, um, uh, portions in to allow lip reading. So as soon as you put a mask on, you lose lip reading. And even, even people with, quote, normal hearing lip read. So um, you then lose and makes communication harder. But if you're a hearing impairment, it's even worse. The problem with these clear plastic screens is they tend to be quite absorbing to sound or, or they resist transmission. So what you gain from the lip reading, you lose from the acoustics. And there's various people have done measurements on that. And so 
just to show you a typical sort of kind of measurement. So to give you a grounding, so 1000 Hertz is in the middle here, that's kind of middle of the speech range. Um, and anything above zero means sound being lost. Um, and uh, so th th this red line is a typical surgical mask, you know, those blue masks are all over the place, those IR masks. And this is a typical cloth mask. And you can see it's much more attenuating uh, than the, uh, than the, uh, than the uh, surgical mask. Um, and it's shown that that can have obviously detrimental effects on communication and various people have measured that. I particularly haven't. Um, and then we get to a, a graph with probably too many lines. I should probably take a few off. But um, this, uh, this bunch of lines up here is all measurements people have previously done. This red one would be a marvelous one mask that we created. Unfortunately, it's using cling film for the clear section. So it's completely uh, mechanically impractical. It's not very long lasting. But this blue one is a different kind of insert. And you can see we're making improvement on the other designs. And that's the design that Michael Stone and others are now taking forward um, to try and improve it. And there's a picture of it on, on the left hand side and, and trying to see how we can. We're putting the pattern out there for the public to make and things like that. And also looking at people to, uh, going on to actually get sort of certification for using in medical fields where you've got all the sort of vent, uh, the uh, aerosol transmission to measure. Going on about this accessibility, we've also worked a lot with BBC R&D about accessible and TV sound. And I should say some of that is with MANCAD and that's still ongoing that work with, with, with MANCAD. Um, and so you're probably familiar with the problem, you know, of people mumbling on the TV. Uh, the Mail, Daily Mail like to moan about this a lot because um, I like bashing the BBC. Um, but basically a, a survey, well, it's 10 years old now, 60% of viewers have difficulty in understanding speech on TV. Um, and we've got to remember that 11 million people are hearing impaired in the UK. That's growing because of the ageing population. Um, and if you look at who watches TV, it's uh, predominantly an older demographic. Um, so there's a, these, these problems create real, real difficulties for people. It's a major leisure activity, but it's also how they communicate more. We're all getting used to it, aren't we, with COVID and talking down Zoom lines and stuff like that, like I'm doing now. Um, so sort of projects we've done is, I don't know if anyone caught up with this, this was in the, I think it might be lockdown one, uh, if you remember that, the heady days lockdown one or the summer of it. Um, Casualty produced a special drama mix all about a hearing impaired character and um, there was actually accessible controls that you could use to improve the mix and that was all coming out of research being done by my colleagues here at Salford working with BBC R&D. So the idea is if you can't hear the dialogue, it's people kind of tend to say, oh, the music in the background is too noisy to so turn the music down. The problem then is you lose the sort of impact of what they're trying to do with the music, which might be setting the mood of the scene. So you, you don't want to just kind of simply just turn everything off but the speech because then the TV program is boring. So you, you've got sort of interplay between how to make this, this, the, uh, the, the sound good, but yes, accessible. And uh, I could show you some other graphs if you want, um, or you can get in contact with me about that. I could show you some other results from that research. So that's one sort of kind of one sort of target. And this was at Casualty, so a mainstream programme, but also on BBC Taster as well. And finally, I'd say there's a network, and this isn't being run by Sulphur, but Sulphur involved on all diversity. So our interest is, I guess, a lot of it's driven by hearing impairment, a lot of it's driven by the aging population um, and the hearing impairment that creates. But there's more to, to difficulties people have with hearing than just, um, or differences in hearing than you have than just hearing impairment. Um, and so one thing we, we uh, a colleague of mine works with on is autism and uh, people on the autistic spectrum ha can have hearing, different hearing um, um, and, and therefore there's this interest in this area called oral diversity to uh, consider how different people hear and then to change the design of things. And I would recommend, if you look at oral diversity and find, find there's a network, they run lots of events, I'd recommend getting involved if that is of interest to you. So a big area of our research is about dealing with noise and noise problems. And I, I picked this picture because that's actually a scanner from Christie's, which we were working on. So this is my colleague, Rick Hughes. This is an acoustic camera here, and this is a huge, great scanner. I actually don't know the type of scanner. I wasn't really involved, but it's huge and it moves a lot. And it looks very heavy. I just got my uh, considered medical opinion. Um, and it was making a really horrible noise. So noise in medical uh, uh, medical treatments and in medical scanners, quite common in, and in wards. 
uh, and cause lots of problems like sleep disturbance in walls, causes problems. I mean, I, I'm sure many of you have been in MRI scanners, they're horrendously noisy. Um, so there's a, there's a problem in trying to make healthcare settings uh, more acceptable from a noise point of view. Um, and so we have a lot of work on noise and vibration control. So that could be individual machines. So this is the individual machine we're treating, but it could be whole buildings trying to make uh, buildings more usable. Um, so uh, we, we do that and we do that from all things, from really small products. I don't know, we've worked with people like Dyson on non-medical stuff all the way up to examples like this, very big, big machines and whole buildings as well. But that also relates to work we've done in noise in, in hospitals. Is it me disconnected? Or... No, I, I can't hear anything. Right. So he's, yes. So Trevor is frozen. I think Trevor's frozen. Yes. I, I wasn't sure whether it's from my side or Trevor actually frozen, but yeah, it looks like he's, oh, and he's, he's just, yeah, looks like his connection was. It looks like he's left the meeting, but hopefully he'll, jo he'll join back yeah, in. So when, let's yes. just give him a minute. It was really interesting. This is a really interesting area of work. And um, I'm really proud that we have this um, research area at Salford, to be honest. So um, do you work in acoustics as well, Hadi? Uh, well, for, for engineering and manufacturing, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I have some some work in that in that area but please feel free to ask your questions or if you would like to come online and um to come live and ask your questions live please feel free to drop a note on the chat box and i will um, ask you to 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 join the conversations and discussion <laughs> i was trying to work out what that um scanner was at the christie the really big ones that when they've got the proton in the proton building with a big scanner connected to where the protons are. So I think it might be that one. I think it is that one. Yes, Peter, but yeah. um, don't count on my word because I've been here for, um, for, for eight weeks only. So. So they're, 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 they're over two floors. So the patient's sort of on the floor above in a bit of the scanner and then the big magnets goes round down to the next floor. <clears throat> Having had an MRI scan on my knee, I know how noisy even the small ones can be. <laughs> yeah, I had similar, had a, I did um, a research study um, in an MRI machine and yeah, I was quite amazed at the, uh, the levels. <laughs> yeah. after, they offered me a radio. 20 minutes, that was it. They offered me the radio, but you couldn't hear the radio. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Have we got Trevor back yet? It doesn't look like it. Oh, not yet. And I tried. Definitely not. Is it worth emailing him? I, um, I tried to reach him on, on his mobile phone, but he hasn't responded yet. And he's offline on his MS Teams account, too. So, yeah, I dropped him a text on his phone. So, Do, uh, is the wide use of your audio room, the, 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 the dampened room, do, 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 is that sort of commercially available? Or do you it know? is commercially available, yeah. Peter, yes. And that, yeah. that was one of the questions I was going to ask um, at the end, if there wasn't enough question for, for Trevor, that, because Trevor is using a lot of learnings from one sector, um, application of his expertise in one sector, 